All right, y'all. Uh, so hopefully by this point, right, this is video B in the playlist. Um, before this, you should watch Kim's uh, guest lecture uh, from Autumn 19, right? It's a pretty old guest lecture, but I think it's super good. Um, that guest lecture pretty much covers everything we covered in like the first micro teach, which is just kind of like an overview of recruiting. Um, Kim explains it like better than I ever could. So I just kind of stole her video for the first part. Um, but in the second video, right, I'm actually going to talk about technical interviewing and like how you can do well in these super odd interviews. Um, and I want to make clear right before we get started, like this is a really weird way to interview for a job, right? Like you're going to go in front of someone and you're going to like solve a coding problem on a whiteboard in front of them. And then they're going to evaluate how you coded in like 30 or 40 minutes. Um, I want to make clear that like, I personally think this is a very flawed way to apply for a job. Like I think it's like, it is at best very tenuous, right? The relationship between like interview performance and like actual job performance. Um, so again, this is a really weird way to interview for a job. We're not even really sure that like it works, right? Um, and it's also like definitely has its built-in biases like for and against certain types of people. Um, so like TLDR, I think this is kind of like a, a scummy bad game. Um, but the flip side of that is that every single tech company does these interviews. Um, so even though it's kind of a rigged and busted game, it's also kind of a game that you have to learn to play, unfortunately, right? Uh, and that's what we're going to do here. We're going to learn how to get really good at these technical interviews and like crush them. Um, all right. So let's beat these tech companies at their own game. Um, to beat the enemy, we first have to like know the enemy, right? What does a technical interview usually look like? Um, so technical interviews are like broken up into like four main phases, right? Um, the first one's honestly pretty straightforward. It's the introduction. Um, like nothing much to say here, y'all. Like you'll walk in hopefully to like a real room if we're like post Corona uh, by next fall. You know, you'll walk into a real room with someone and you'll be like, yo, my name is so-and-so. Uh, and if they're not totally rude, they'll respond back in kind, right? Um, can't offer y'all too much uh, on this first part. Like, don't forget your name. Like I kind of did that <laughs> in one of my interviews for a little bit because I was really nervous. So don't do that. Um, general confidence, right? Like firm handshake or firm like elbow bump, I guess uh, for Corona times. But yeah, not much I can offer here y'all. Um, just be yourselves, right? Because y'all are like likable people and just like let that shine through. The second part's a little more interesting, right? Um, this is before you actually start like answering the coding question they give you. Um, but in the second part, usually like, and not all interviewers do this, um, but most interviewers before they give you the coding question, they'll be like, oh, like tell me a cool project you've worked on that you're super proud about. Um, this is why if you look at the earlier slides, we really, really recommend that you join an RSO or in some other way, right? get a lot of coding experience outside of your class projects before fall, right? So over summer, you should join an RSO with a strong code focus. You should contribute to something open source. Like you should have some big coding project you work on with other people, right? Because that's a very industry type thing. So that like, you know, after you work on that over summer, right? You can talk about it here and you can talk about it on your resume to actually like get to this point. Um, so if you get nothing else from this video, join an RSO now or find some big coding project soon that you can like contribute to. Um, so you have something cool you can talk about to like catch people's attention and make yourself look good here. Um, the main part, like if you look at distribution of time, right, is really answering their coding question. Um, don't worry, y'all, we're going to get here later in horrifyingly gory detail, I promise. Um, but the last part, um, this is kind of surprising at first, right? But after you answer their coding question, and like hopefully you've crushed it, right? Um, after you answer their coding question, they're usually gonna be like, hey, like, do you have any questions for me? Like, are you curious about what it's like to work here, et cetera? Wanna make one thing super clear about this that like personally I did not know, but like I learned out or I found out later kind of the hard way. Um, they'll tell you that like, oh, no pressure. Like you don't have to ask anything, ask whatever you want. Um, you have to ask a question, right? Like, so 
there is no formal rule for this. But if they ask you, like, do you have any questions for me? And then you literally are like, no, I have no questions. Um, then you just look really bad, right? Like you look like you don't care about the company and you look like you, you, like, you aren't invested in like learning more about this place, right? Um, so the rule is, right, if they do ask you, do you have questions for me, right? If they do open the floor to you to ask them a question, ask them at least one or two. So you like at least look like you care about the company. Um, again, this is kind of like a secret rule that's like not really stated, but really like you should ask them at least one or two questions to like show investment, I feel like. All right, so just backing up, the main part is like answering their coding question, right? Um, kind of coming up with a good algorithm that actually works. So let's see how to do that. Um, so this is really weird, right? Like coding for other people on a whiteboard and then like explaining your thought process this is like a super scary like experience. Um, so luckily, a while ago, um, Casey came up with this like patent pending, not really, but it, this really cool like structured way to break down a technical interview question, right? So that like you're not just kind of like freewheeling and like writing down random code and like freaking out, right? This is kind of a step by step process to answering a coding question that you get during a technical interview. Um, the acronym is called TBOIT because Casey came up with this a while ago. Um, we tried really hard for like a week to come up with a different acronym, but we couldn't think of one. So it's still TBOIT, um, even though Tim Tebow hasn't been relevant since 2012. And also he's like on a personal level, kind of a problematic person, but like we couldn't think of a better acronym. So it's TBOIT y'all. Um, so what does TBOIT stand for? Talk example, brute force, optimize, walk through, and then implement and test. Whoa, what does all that mean, right? So this is a structured way to attack coding questions that you get. Um, but I think it's gonna make more sense if I just kind of demonstrate for you each of these steps on an example problem. Um, so let's pretend that like I'm walking into like, I don't know, some tech company, let's call it like my face or something like that, right? For like, not annoying actual tech companies. Um, and let's say I get this actual problem. Given an array of n integers, return an array that stores the prefix sum of the input. So this is my like imaginary practice interview problem that I'm now going to show the TBOIT method on. So one thing I want to make clear, right? Um, and this is related to our first step talk, um, is honestly, y'all, like, a lot of these questions are super bad, right? Like, and this one's really like a good example of that, right? Um, like, what is a prefix sum? Like, like, what even is that? This is such a poorly worded question, right? Um, and that's why this first step, T, talk, is so important, right? So in the first step of T, it, T or talk, you're just gonna ask a bunch of clarifying questions, right? Like. Again, you really have to do this a lot of the time because these questions are like intentionally vague sometimes or unintentionally vague because like, you know, they just did a bad job writing it. Um, so if it was me, right, in an interview, I'd be like, hey, um, what's a prefix sum, right? Like, can you explain what that is to me, right? Because like the question doesn't really make that clear. Um, another thing you can do in the talk step, right, as you're clarifying the question and like trying to make things more concrete, is you can ask about like corner case or edge case inputs, right? Like ask the interviewer, hey, like I'm acknowledging that like maybe my input might be empty. Is that something I have to worry about? Or like, are you cool if I just kind of ignore that? Um, again, the point of this first step of talk is really just clarifying the question and like talking to your interviewer to like clarify exactly what they want from you. Again, these questions are sometimes written pretty badly so before you start doing anything else, you need to make sure that like you and your interviewer are on the same page about like what you actually need to do. So that's talk. Just try to shore up the problem as much as you can by like going back and forth with your interviewer on like what you're actually being asked. So the second step after you kind of clarify and talk things over with your interviewer is the example step. This is super important. Um, so now hopefully like, now that you've done T or talk, you understand what's actually being asked of you. Um, and you're in a good position to actually give 
a couple of example inputs and outputs for the code you're supposed to write. Again, we haven't written even a single line of code. Like we haven't even gone there yet. Before we start writing code, it's important for us to actually come up with specific example inputs and outputs, right? This is another way, first of all, to make sure that like we're all on the same page, right? You and the interviewer. Um, and then later in the last step of Tbowit, where you're testing your code, these example inputs and outputs will become super important, right? So that's why we kind of generate them really early. Um, one thing I do want to note here, right, is during the first step where you're talking with your interviewer, right, and you're clarifying, they might just do this for you, right? Like, realistically, in this problem, if I ask my interviewer, like, what's a prefix sum, like, that's super unclear, they probably, like, give me an example like this one, right? So sometimes your interviewer will actually handle this step for you by, like, giving you an example input and output, in which case, yay, right, you can make it more if you want, but, like, they've kind of done a little bit of the work uh, for you. For our specific problem, right? Um, hopefully my interviewer will clarify what the heck a prefix sum is because it's super vague. Um, and it turns out a prefix sum, right? If this is my input array, um, the prefix sum is really adding up everything cumulatively index by index in the output. Um, so what I mean, right, is at this index, right, in the output, array or the prefix sum array, right? This index in the output corresponds to the sum of the corresponding index in the input array forward, right? So eight is here because at the corresponding index, we have one in the input plus four plus three is eight. Similarly, right? In this last index of the output array, I have 10 because at the corresponding index of the input, I have two plus everything before it. So two plus one plus four plus three is 10, right? Again, the prefix sum is just kind of like cumulatively summing up everything as I march through the input array. Um, but I wouldn't know that if I hadn't actually asked my interviewer to clarify this for me, um, which is why that first step is so important. Probably the most important step besides like actually writing the code. I think. All right, so where are we? So you've like clarified things with your interviewer because these questions are just written badly sometimes. You've come up with a couple example inputs and outputs. Now it's time to actually think about like, how would I solve this, right? So this is like one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're interviewing, right? Like they try to jump right to like writing the code and like a super fancy, crazy, amazing solution, right? Um, so this is a trap, right? Like it's way better to like slow down a little bit and think about what you're going to do before you start writing the code, right? Like I've actually had this experience a lot too. Um, sometimes when you start like jumping to the code immediately, you like don't realize there's a problem and you kind of box yourself into a corner, right? And you actually end up running out of time. What we do in the Tboet method, right? It's instead of like jumping like straight to writing code, what you do in this third step is you just think of anything that could solve the problem, right? Like literally any algorithm you could run at all that would actually like do what the interviewer wants, right? That generates the correct output. So this can be a super like terrible, crappy solution. This can be like an end to the third, end to the fourth, like really horrible runtime solution. Um, like these solutions are sometimes called brute force solutions, which is where, you know, this step gets its name. Um, but yeah, in this step, we're just trying to think of literally any way to solve the problem, even if it's a really bad, terrible one, right? So there's two reasons for this. One, these crappy solutions, like, they're usually a lot easier to like see, right? So they're kind of easier to come up with than like some of the better, faster solutions, which tend to be a little bit fancier, right? And also, right, if you find yourself in a situation where you're running out of time, right? Like you only have 10 minutes left in the interview or something, thinking of a crappy slow solution and then still having time to code it out is way better than like, trying to jump right to a really fast solution and getting stuck, right? Like, believe it or not, 
coding up the brute force solution because that's all you could think of. Um, that has gotten 373 TAs to pass interviews before, like believe it or not. Um, so never, never like underestimate the value of a brute force solution. It's much better to like come up with one of these and it gets stuck all together. So for our problem, right? Like specifically the prefix sum problem, what would a brute force solution look like? Um, well, here's one. Um, if I want this eight, for example, in the output, I just go to the corresponding index of the input array, which holds a one, and then sum up everything at that index and before. So to get eight, I would sum up one, four, and three. To get 10, I would sum up two, one, four, three, right? I kind of have like a double loop. I'm looping over indices of the output. And then to like fill in each of those output indices, I have to loop over some input indices. Um, so kind of a like crappy solution, like double loops usually aren't that great. Um, but again, it's something that solves the problem, right? That if I'm running out of time, I can at least code up, right? Which is always better than nothing. Um, so yeah, that's the brute force step. Come up with literally any way to solve the problem, right? Because that's better than getting stuck. All right, this next step is O or optimize, right? We've gone, we've gone to T, E, B, and now O. In the optimize step, right, we are taking that crappy, slow, ugly, brute force solution that we just generated, right? And if we have time, right, we're going to try to take it and turn it into like a nicer solution. Usually with these like brute force solutions, there's like something they're overlooking or some extra work that they're doing that you can like try and optimize or tease out, right? Um, so again, this is why the actually the previous step of brute force is so important. Um, you kind of have to start somewhere before you start optimizing to like the pretty nice, super fast solution um, that the interviewer probably has in their head. Um, so one note, like as you're optimizing, right? as you're turning your brute force solution into a nice fast one, you really want to be talking out loud, right? Like you have to explain your thought process like throughout this entire interview, but especially here, right? Um, the interviewer, right? They're not just evaluating whether you've got the right code. They're also paid to inter like evaluate your thought process, right? Like how do you think? Um, but if you don't like talk out loud, right? If you don't walk the interviewer through your thought process as you try to optimize, they're not gonna see that. Um, so personally, what I do is I say things like, okay, I'm not sure this will work, but I see potentially this thing that we can improve. Let's try to do that. If not, I wanna try this other thing. Just like make it very clear to the interviewer what your thought process is as you're trying to optimize your code. And really you should do that for every part uh, actually, I think of the interview. So yeah, uh, another quick note too, um, this is why it's so important to practice lead code, right? Like what I told my students is that if you're interviewing for a tech job in fall 2021, like between now and spring and fall, so like over the summer, you should be doing maybe like a lead code question a day. Um, just cause like the more of these weird coding questions you do, the better you get at this step actually the better you get at like spotting redundant work and figuring out how to optimize it. Um, when in doubt, the joke is use, use a hash table. That's like the, the 373 meme, right? But like, as you practice more and more, you'll get better at seeing like where you can actually optimize stuff out. So let's think about our problem and how we would optimize it, right? So let's say we have a little bit of extra time. We came up with that ugly brute force solution, but we have an extra 10 minutes where like, before we write the code, we can try to like think of how to make it better. Um, one thing we might notice, right? And of course, we're gonna talk out loud and we're going to explain this to our interviewer as we're thinking about it. Um, one thing we're gonna notice is like, hey, maybe uh, interviewer, I don't need a double loop. Maybe I can try to get down to one loop somehow. Well, how would I do that? Let's know something about this output array, right? This output array is cumulative, right? Each time I move from this element or like one element in the output to the next element in the output, 
I'm summing in another element from the input array. For example, to get from eight to 10 in the output, I'm taking this cumulative sum of eight and then I'm summing in two to get 10. So maybe I don't have to do a double loop. Maybe I just have to use like my input and my output smartly, right? And that's exactly what we're gonna do. Each time like we fill in an index of the output array, we're gonna do what I just said. We're just gonna look at the previous element of the output plus the corresponding element of the input. So to get eight, for example, I just have to look at seven plus one to get eight, right? So now I've turned my double loop into a single loop. Um, and that's definitely a really good optimized step. All right, so five, right? We've done T-E-B-O. Now we're at W, right? We're finishing off the Tebo part, walkthrough. So again, I wanna be clear. Up to this point, we have written zero code. We're all just like clarifying and thinking and talking. We haven't actually written any code on the whiteboard yet. Now we're at this point, right, where we've clarified the question, we've come up with example inputs and outputs, and like now after optimizing our brute force solution, conceptually we're at an algorithm that we think is pretty good. So before we start writing code, it's always good to like walk your interviewer through and be like, hey, conceptually, this is what I'm doing. Again, this is important for like the same reason I said earlier. Um, you want to explain your thought process, right? You want your interviewer to like know conceptually what you're doing and why you think it's a good idea. Um, another benefit is, right? Like it'll make it easier for your interviewer to actually understand your code if you give them kind of like a conceptual explanation of what you're trying to do. Think of like what you would write in a code comment, that kind of overview uh, of what you're trying to achieve. Bonus two, um, if you walk your interviewer through, right? And like there's a little bug conceptually in what you're trying to do, a lot of the times they'll point that out and they'll give you a hint on how to fix it. Um, so this is a really valuable step. The bonus of this too, right? is if you've done a good job of talking out loud, right? If you've like been explaining your thought process during like brute force and optimize, um, then this is pretty much done, right? If you did a good job of talking out loud, the interviewer probably knows like what your conceptual plan of attack is anyway. Um, so this should be pretty quick for you. So just recap like all of the talking out loud that you've done, right? Or the thinking out loud rather. All right, so now we've done Tebow. Now it's time for I implement. So we've done all of this work, right? We've explained it to our interviewer. We have a solution we think is pretty good. Now, finally, it's time to code it up. Um, honestly, y'all, I don't have much, uh, much advice for this other than you need to practice a lot. Like do those leak code questions. Because um, uh, like when you're doing this like in real life, you'll either be typing into like some interview app on like your web browser, or you'll like physically be in person writing on a whiteboard with a marker. Um, in both of these situations, you'll find that coding like on a whiteboard, whether it's like a digital whiteboard or a real whiteboard is really hard, right? Like we've been using IntelliJ all quarter, right? And IntelliJ and other IDEs have these kind of autocomplete and like other features that will save you, right? If you're making a mistake, it'll be like, hey, that method doesn't exist. Or, hey, you forgot a parameter here. Whiteboards are whiteboards, right? Like the technology has been around for like a thousand years. Like the whiteboards don't have autocomplete, right? Like whiteboards don't have syntax highlighting. Um, so it's important for you to like practice this, right? Like practice on a real whiteboard if you have one or like answer your leak code questions on like a piece of paper if you don't have a whiteboard. Um, just get, used, get really used to like coding by hand without an IDE because trust me y'all, it's like harder than you think. Um, and you want to be comfortable with this like by the time you're actually interviewing next fall. Um, other note too, like, um, like unless your interviewer is like a real jerk, in which case I'm sorry, um, they probably won't ding you too much if you like make small syntax errors, right? Like if you, for, if you forget a return type somewhere, but it's like very clear what the return type of your method is, like unless your interviewer is really a jerk and like, unfortunately I've had some of those, right? But unless your interviewer is really a jerk, they probably won't ding you too much. Um, so don't sweat the tiny details. Try to get like the high level stuff correct at least. So 
but here's like, if you're curious, um, here's what the code looks like for our prefix sum problem. Um, the code pretty much is exactly what I told you verbally, right, for the optimized solution. Um, for the output array, like the first thing in the output array is the first thing in the input array, right? Because like there's nothing before this in the input array. Um, and then to get every other element of the output, I just have to look at the previous element of the output, right? And then the corresponding index of the input array, right? So for example, to get seven, I just have to look at three plus four to get seven, right? To get 10, I just have to look at eight plus two to get 10. And this is actually a nice optimized linear runtime solution that's like gonna guess this tech job and make us a whole lot of money, right? So yay, we did it y'all. Um, the final step is test, right? So let's say I've written this code. Um, it's always good to check that like your interview answer is correct because sometimes it's not. Um, and even if you mess up, right? Messing up and then realizing it and catching it, even if you like run out of time, right? If you're like, oh shoot, my answer is wrong. And like, that's the cutoff. That still looks a heck of a lot better than messing up and not realizing it. Um, this is actually a step that like, admittedly, I'm kind of guilty of skipping a lot. Like sometimes I'll just write the code and I'll be like, oh, you know, there it is. I want to go home, I'm tired. Um, so a lot of candidates don't do this last step, um, but if you do it, that means that you'll look really good and you'll look like you're serious about this, right? Um, and this is why, this is where that like E step, right? The example step comes in handy. Um, we all backing up, backing up, backing up. We already literally made some example inputs and outputs in the second step of tbowit here. So for the last step of tbowit, which is test, let's literally just run our program on this example input to make sure we get the example output back. Um, and for us, right, it actually checks out. And we know that this code that we wrote here actually does prefix sum. So again, you can skip this if you have no time, but honestly, most people do skip this. Um, and if you do it, I guarantee that you will like stand out in, in like your interviewer's head. Um, so yeah, test is the last step. You may not have time for it, but I really recommend you do this step if you have the time. Um, just because like it makes you look good. Um, and honestly, like, let's be real, real y'all. Um, most companies code bases are like completely on fire and like garbage and like breaking all the time. Um, if you look like you care about testing, they're gonna love you, right? Like no one, like people don't care about testing enough, which is why like all these services go down all the time and like terrible things happen. Um, so in addition to like checking your answer, this just makes you look like a really valuable person to hire in the interview. Um, so highly recommend the test step. And that's, that's it, y'all. That's how to crush your technical interview. Um, if you actually look at the worksheet, there are a couple like fun interview problems that you can try to Tebow yourself. Um, those are problems two, and then also a challenge problem in problem three. And if you want another uh, Tebow it walkthrough on a different problem, so not prefix some, you can check out problem one on our PDF. Um, it's a Tebowit walkthrough, but actually an even harder problem uh, than the one we saw here. But yeah, that's it, y'all. The TAs hope this interview prep section was fun. We kind of had like a free section somewhere that we had to fill, so this is what we picked. Um, but yeah, always feel free to post on Ed or email your TA um, if you have questions about interviewing. Um, honestly, y'all, like TAs, like, they do refer students somewhat often. So like, if you're, never hurts to ask, right? Like butter your TF a little bit, be like, oh, you taught me so much. Can you interview, can you like refer me to company X where you work now? And like, they'll probably say yes. Like we all have egos, y'all, we'll do it. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. And then let us know if you have other questions. Stay safe, y'all.